Tonight, London lights up the way home as the Queen returns to Buckingham Palace. A massive security operation unfolding to protect up to a million mourners. The Andrews government tells a brain tumour patient left in limbo to roll with the punches. Australian shares take a $60 billion nosedive. And in sport, James Hurd makes a pitch for the Bombers' top job and the down low on red carpet fashion for the brown low. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. The Queen is back in London tonight after returning to an extraordinary, spontaneous welcome from thousands. They lined streets, lighting the way and applauding as the hearse made its way to Buckingham Palace. Right now, mourners are starting to queue early for one last goodbye. The final homecoming. The late Queen Elizabeth II returned from Scotland to London five days after her death. To spend one last night at Buckingham Palace, the building which shaped her entire life. Guided in toward the gates by the lights of her subjects' mobile phones. In the wet and the cold, thousands had waited outside while waiting inside her family. Charles, Camilla, Anne, Andrew, Edward, William, Kate and Harry and Meghan. Together with their matriarch, grief bringing unity again. A private moment before a very public farewell. After 24 hours lying in state in Edinburgh, the Queen of Scots was carried out of St Giles Cathedral. The only sound, the lament of a lone piper. Shouldered by the kilted pallbearers, her coffin was loaded carefully into the hearse. The next stage of her long journey, the Royal Mile, the first of many, back to London. The Queen loved Scotland. It seemed beyond doubt that Scotland loved her too. A lot of memories, sad and, uh, and happy. And we're just very proud to have been here. It's just a wonderful, amazing, emotional day. And our heart just goes out toward the family. The strain and the pain. Gently rolling past crowds of roadside well-wishers. This was Scotland's final farewell to their monarch and for many, their neighbour. The Queen spent so much time at her Balmoral estate. It was, in her own words, where some of her happiest memories were made. We'll remember this day for the rest of our life. Sad, but, but lovely. <laughs> Miss her terribly, I think. <laughs> Everybody will, I think. Prince Charles had prayed last week for flights of angels to take his mother. Today, it was an RAF C-17. The world leader on a globe master. A huge aircraft for such a small coffin. A measure of the enormity of the moment. Only last year, the hull of this giant cargo plane was full of refugees fleeing Afghanistan. No! Oh! Escorting the Queen for this entire trip, her only daughter, Princess Anne. She'd take the flight as well, with her mother for the final days of her life and her first days in death. The Princess Royal saying in a statement, it had been an honour and a privilege to accompany her on her final journeys. To my mother, the Queen, thank you, she said. Like every Queen's flight, this one bore the call sign Kitty Hawk. Air traffic control will hear that signal no more. Then from the bright sunshine of the Scottish Highlands to a wet and wounded London, a city soaked in grief. The King's colour for the Royal Air Force lowered in salute by the Honour Guard. Their former Commander-in-Chief had returned. There was no band, no music, met at the airport by the Queen's 15th and final Prime Minister. Princess Anne's duty done, the coffin handed to police protection for the final run home. 
The entire one-hour route into the capital was lined with people ignoring the conditions to stand in the rain and pay tribute. The nearer she came, the bigger the crowds, the louder the cheers. Again and again along the route, Her Majesty brought traffic to a standstill. Drivers parking their cars on the motorway. They didn't want to miss their chance to honour the Queen or to witness this. It was the first time this hearse had been used. A modified Land Rover, it was designed with the help of the Queen. The oversized windows and interior lights allowing the public a clear view of her coffin. Her old adage, she had to be seen to be believed, true even in death. Inside, the casket no longer draped in the Royal Standard of Scotland, replaced with that of the United Kingdom. So she is home after a history-making, emotion-filled journey from Balmoral to Buckingham Palace, 500 miles. There is one mile to go, Westminster, where Britain will have its final chance to say goodbye. Authorities had altered and extended the route into the palace to take Her Majesty past more crowds, more mourners, more witnesses to history. The police escort delivered her to the palace gates, their heads bowed, job done. God bless you. God bless you. Gently driven through those gates and into a very private homecoming, one night with family before she's handed back to the nation. And Chris Reason is outside Buckingham Palace now. Chris, of all the days we've seen so far, this will be the most emotional yet. From her official London residence, Peter, she's going to be going up the mall here where so many people have gathered uh, so many times in the last 70 years of her reign to cheer and celebrate, most recently, of course, the Platinum Jubilee in June. But it turns out that was a farewell party. Today, though, the chance for the public to congregate again for their very personal goodbye, and they will be standing so close to the Queen's coffin, the King and the Princes walking behind. And that, of course, will evoke so many images and memories of Princess Diana's funeral 25 years ago. And today, just like then, they will be walking in absolute silence. Chris Reason, outside Buckingham Palace, thank you. Britain is mounting the biggest security operation in its history to provide protection for the outpouring of grief. It involves 10,000 police officers, special forces and MI6 under a plan that's been decades in the making. In the grounds by Buckingham Palace, the crowds and flowers grow by the hour as if nature has sprung to a royal salute. But seeing the amount of people, you knew that it was going to be big. I just don't, I didn't expect this emotion. Even the very youngest creating lifelong memories. This is the Queen. It has a starty hour and a, and a star for us being the Queen. With millions pouring into the city, London stepping up train services to cope with the crush from across the world. So we just packed our stuff um, and came here, thought we'd um, drop some flowers and pass on our condolences. Mourners camping out for days just for a glimpse. This woman means so much to me that it's the least I can do. My dad did the coronation. Yeah, my family said, no, you're crazy. You know, they no, you know, I don't want to miss it. Within hours, the Queen's coffin will be taken from Buckingham Palace in a procession down the Mall. It will be escorted by the King, his brothers and sister and Princes William and Harry. They'll follow across the Horse Guards Parade, Downing Street and the Cenotaph, arriving at Westminster Hall as Big Ben chimes three o'clock. It will trigger an even tighter ring of steel. Police putting decades of planning into action. Oh, it's, it's huge, it's massive. It's probably the biggest event that London's seen in many, many years. 10,000 police officers, special forces on high alert and spy agency MI6 braced for a United Nations of world leaders. An unprecedented operation to protect the people and dignitaries coming into London. Some key omissions from that guest list, Russia, Belarus and Myanmar all excluded. Iran will only send an ambassador. Hostile states who would love to see it disrupted because of the activities that we're supporting overseas. Another security challenge, the queue to witness the lying in state. Starting at the Palace of Westminster, it will cross Lambeth Bridge over the Thames, then past landmarks including the London Eye and HMS Belfast before reaching its endpoint, Southwark Park. 
more than seven kilometres, about a 90-minute walk. It's gradually going to build up into the most extraordinary crescendo. As the city embraces its last chance to bid goodbye. In London, Ashley Mullaney, Seven News. And Amelia Brace is tracking the crowd tonight. Amelia, it's growing by the hour. Yes, it is, but unfortunately, as this queue gets longer, so too do the wait times. And with a million people expected, some just won't make it in. Those who are already in line are uh, being told that the wait at the moment is 36 hours, but that will stretch out to around 48. Overnight, we have seen camping, which is technically banned. Instead, there is a wristband system in place, so people can come and go to the bathroom without losing their place in the queue. There are also a thousand volunteers on the ground here to make sure that that system works and also that these people have been kept safe through the night. Now, when they do finally make it over to Westminster Hall this evening, they're being told to expect airport style security before they can finally pass into that chamber to pay their respects to the Queen. Peter? Extraordinary scenes indeed. Amelia Brace, thank you. And Hugh Whitfeld is on the procession route at Horse Guards Parade. Hugh, this is a moment in history for the crowds joining you. Peter London really hasn't seen anything like this in more than a century. The Queen's coffin will be the first of that of a monarch to travel this route from Buckingham Palace to Westminster since the death of King Edward VII back in 1910. As the crowd continues to build here, we on the street and you watching at home live will be able to see a tradition that dates back centuries. After five days away from the British capital, uh, this London component of proceedings feels particularly fitting for all of Her Majesty's Scottish heritage and her love of the countryside. Elizabeth was a London girl, born here, raised along with her sister. They lived with their parents in a townhouse on Piccadilly, not far from here, long before there was ever any thought that she might become queen. Today, the long farewell to the monarch who was never really meant to be will take another emotional turn. Peter. Hugh Whitfeld on Horse Guards Parade. Thank you. King Charles has made a historic visit to Northern Ireland as the nation mourns. It was a show of unity as part of a relentless schedule that led to a flash of temper. In a country often defined by its divisions, a conscious effort by the new king to build on his mother's legacy of bringing people together. A public walkabout near Hillsborough Castle. Admiring a corgi, his mother's favourite breed, and the thousands of floral tributes. Before signing a visitor's book, where it seemed the grief and stress of the past week may have caught up with him. Oh, God, I hate this. Oh, going to happen to Frustrated by a leaking fountain pen. It's the second time in days he's been visibly annoyed, previously telling an aide to get rid of a pen holder cluttering his desk. Charles blowing up, but back in control to meet Northern Ireland's most senior politicians, including Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill, a nationalist committed to leaving the United Kingdom and with it, the monarchy. Well, you played a great role here in terms of reconciliation and building peace, so it's the end of an era for sure. In 2011, the Queen became the first British monarch to visit an independent island. The following year, a watershed moment. Her Majesty shaking hands with Martin McGuinness, a former commander of the IRA. My mother felt deeply, I know, the significance of the role she herself played in bringing together those whom history had separated. The Assembly Speaker, also a former member of the IRA, his speech laced with political undertones, but respectful. She personally underlined that one tradition is not diminished by reaching out to show respect to another. They don't come more loyal to the Crown than here on Shankill Road, unionists who cherish their British identity and the Queen. Yeah, what can one say? You know, the Queen we thought she would last forever. 
Throughout her long reign, the Queen was painfully aware of the tragedies that have plagued Northern Ireland and the fact that peace here remains fragile. She was determined to help people put the past into perspective, a responsibility that now rests on the shoulders of the new King. I think Charles more so than all of the, the royals was a defender of what he always called was all the fates. Several no facts were represented at a service of thanksgiving and reflection in the city's cathedral. The word which I think will be most associated with Queen Elizabeth and Ireland North and South is reconciliation. A visit the palace hopes will help preserve the unity of the United Kingdom. In Belfast, Sarah Greenwich, 7 News. And 7 News will bring you live coverage of the Queen's final journey from the special time of 8.40 tonight. A senior Andrews government minister has been forced to apologise after she told a cancer patient driven to extremes to roll with the punches. Jodie Lee joins us now. And Jodie, the woman was forced to head interstate to get a vital brain scan. Mitch, it really is the last thing you'd want to hear when you're battling a brain tumour and have been forced to drive from Melbourne to Adelaide to undergo an MRI. Education Minister Natalie Hutchins made these comments this morning. Some eight hours later, she and the Health Minister were in damage control and backtracking. Diagnosed with a brain tumour and in urgent need of surgery, Kylie Hennessy and her husband were aghast to realise she couldn't get the scans she needed in Victoria. It's been disgusting, to be personally honest. We live in Australia. We're a first world country. Both available machines were broken. The couple forced to drive to Adelaide. Their plight seemingly dismissed by a senior Andrews government minister. But I do know from my experience in the, in the health system that sometimes you've just got to roll with the punches. That immediately sparked outrage. Shameful and insulting comments today. By early afternoon, an apology of sorts online. I understand this may have caused some distress and I am sorry. Then, just before four, the health minister, who wasn't available all day, appeared to clean up the mess. I want to acknowledge the really stressful set of circumstances that Miss Hennessy has found herself in. The issue, functional MRIs. They're extremely specialised, but experts agree Victorians in need should have access to them. Former AMA chief Dr Mukesh Haikawal says it's emblematic of Victoria's crumbling health system. We are almost a laughing stock uh, and it's an intolerable position for Victorians to find themselves in. A prickly political issue with very personal consequences. Because we don't want anybody else to go through what we've had to go through. Kylie Hennessy now faces the fight of her life as she prepares to undergo brain surgery here at the Alfred Hospital. But she won't be alone. Her friends and family will be by her side every step of the way. They're all going to be there to, to help and support me. So, yeah, I think we've got this. Jodie Lee, 7 News. Triple M has announced that Wayne Carey is no longer part of its AFL commentary team. The station released a statement confirming he has concluded his contract and won't return in 2023. The 51-year-old was taken off air after he was kicked out of Perth's Crown Casino over a bag of white powder. Carey insists the bag contained a legal painkiller for his neck and shoulder injuries. $60 billion has been wiped off the value of Australia's share market in a dramatic day. The plunge follows Wall Street's worst session in more than two years. Overnight, as Australia slept, Wall Street slumped. The direction of the US economy befuddling the experts again and rattling investors in a huge way. The Dow Jones down nearly 4%, the S&P 500 4.3 and the technology heavy Nasdaq taking the biggest bath of all. Wall Street's worst session since June 2020. Why did it happen? Simple. Inflation. Prices in the US rising by 8.3% on a year earlier. Only a little more than expected, but enough for the Federal Reserve to push ahead with aggressive interest rate hikes. The share market didn't like that and that flowed through to Australia this morning. $66 billion wiped off the ASX within the first hour. The final tally? $60 billion of losses. Hardest hit were technology companies like Xero and Afterpay owner Block. 
But major retailers, including Wes Farmers and JB Hi-Fi, also sank, and the supermarkets went with them, while the big four banks tumbled as well, particularly Combank and NAB. The Aussie dollar wasn't spared either, retesting its lowest level since May 2020. Despite the falls, our local share market is still higher than it was a week ago, and after five consecutive interest rate hikes, it's only lost 10% so far this year. Since January, Wall Street has suffered far greater losses. Still, a recovery could take time. It's very hard to see the Australian share market at the moment undertaking a sustained rally. Growth is slowing, interest rates are rising, uh, and valuations are pretty stretched at this moment. Gemma Acton, 7 News. Tim Watson joins us now with a look ahead to sport. And Tim, James Hurd has put up his hand to coach Essendon. Mitch, discussions have ramped up. Chief Football Reporter Tom Brown is live with the details. And Tom Hurdy was interviewed today. Tim, one of the biggest questions in football was whether James Hurd would put his hand up to apply for the vacant Essendon coaching position. Not only has he put his hand up, he's interviewed here in the city for more than two hours. So it would represent one of the biggest comebacks in football history. Now, that panel is still conducting interviews with separate applicants. I'll have those exclusive details and pictures shortly in sports, Tim. Thanks, Tom. Also, the dinner date with the Magpies coach that saved Mason Cox's career. And has a new suitor emerged, making a play for Demons Ruckman, Luke Jackson. Plenty more sport coming up a little bit later, Mitch. OK, thank you, Tim. We'll see you then. A major COVID rule is on the way out. Coming up, we've lived with it for three years, but time's running out for home ISO. We'll have the details next. Also, a boxer fighting to clear his name of a murder, even though another man has confessed. A big security blitz at one of our ports. And why an Australian favourite has been dropped. And there's rain overnight, but it warms up again tomorrow. Then there's more rain. I'll show you how much later in seven years. A security blitz is underway at one of the country's busiest regional ports in southwest Victoria. Police are inspecting vehicles and vessels at Portland, while Border Force is looking for signs of organised crime and drug importation. We also bring an underwater drone capability, which is uh, uh, extremely effective. Workers will also be subjected to identity checks. Pandemic leave payments will continue for as long as COVID isolation remains mandatory. But there are new rules surrounding eligibility for that support to stop people from rorting the system. For the 5 million Australian workers with no access to sick leave, some added security. The payment will remain available for as long as mandatory isolation periods are applied by all states and territories. Paid pandemic leave was to finish at the end of this month, no more. The isolation period has been reduced from seven to five days from last Friday, the payments falling from $750 to $540 and will now be further limited to prevent rorting. Three payments over a period of six months uh, would be the maximum. Agreed at a half hour virtual National Cabinet meeting this morning. The States and Commonwealth have been sharing the cost of the payment since July, $2.2 billion. At least one Premier wants all restrictions lifted as soon as possible. What we need to do is move to a system where if you're sick you stay at home, if you're not sick you go to work and you go to school. National Cabinet will discuss a timetable for doing that at its next meeting on September 30. That isolation period will need to go at some point in the coming months before summer. The medical advice is improving. Aged care infections are now a quarter of the number they were in July. And arrangements have been finalised for the National Memorial Service for the Queen here in Parliament's Great Hall next Thursday. It will be televised nationally and begin at 11am with a minute silence. All uh, First Ministers, Premiers and, and Chief Ministers will travel uh, to Canberra and will be present uh, on that day. A day of remembrance and thanks. Mark Riley, 7 News. A Melbourne boxer has lost a fight to overturn a murder conviction, even though another man confessed to the crime. Khalid ba Baker has already served a long jail sentence for the death, but is vowing to clear his name. From confident to crushed, Khalid Baker denied the opportunity to clear his name. 
I'm very disappointed. It's not the outcome that I wanted. Baker served 13 years in prison for a crime he says he didn't commit. A jury finding the talented boxer guilty of murder after a man died falling from a window in Brunswick in 2005. A friend of Baker's has always claimed he was the one who pushed the man to his death, but his initial confession was deemed inadmissible in Baker's original trial. The friend repeated his admissions to the Court of Appeal last month, but today three judges ruled the evidence could not be trusted or used to overturn Baker's conviction. We're absolutely gutted. Um, uh, and I, I have to say it was completely unexpected. How can there be anything more substantial than someone saying the same thing from the moment they were interviewed by the police? Despite today's significant setback, Khalid Baker says he'll keep on fighting. He now plans to take his appeal to the High Court with work on that legal battle to start immediately. I'm an innocent man and we're going to get this case overturned and uh, I'm, I will clear my name one way or another. Estelle Greeping, 7 News. Lemon soft drink Lyft has been dumped and will disappear from shops by the end of the year. Coca-Cola won't say why, just that it's evolving its products to provide more of what people want. It believes the new Sprite Lemon Plus range with added caffeine will be a suitable replacement for Lyft fans. There's a boost for young Victorians trying to catch up after COVID. Next, a quarter of a billion dollars to help struggling students. Also, family heartache over a schoolboy tragedy. He was killed by a drug driver on his 16th birthday. And why the lights are being switched off at one of the world's most famous landmarks. Virgin has responded to demand from AFL fans adding six extra flights to and from Sydney for the rest of the finals. Thousands of frustrated Collingwood fans were frozen out by skyrocketing airfares. 1,000 seats are now up for grabs. The airline has promised another release for fans wanting to get to Melbourne for the grand final. New documents have revealed Victoria's emergency call centre's request for permanent funding was knocked back in favour of a one-off payment. The Emergency Services Authority requested $1.2 million in 2020 to meet rising demand. The state government is under fire over the funding of ESTA after 33 Victorians died because of issues with the service. Heartbroken parents have shared their grief and anger after a driver killed their son on his 16th birthday. The killer was high on ice and on the wrong side of the road when he struck the schoolboy in front of his girlfriend. Lachlan McLaren's final act was to save the life of his girlfriend, Elamani, moving her out of the way of a speeding and out of control ute just in time. He took the full impact and died on his 16th birthday. The collision occurred after drug fueled and unlicensed driver Christopher Hennessy had driven 800 metres in the wrong direction on the Nepean Highway. In a victim impact statement, Elamani told the court she has since been diagnosed with depression, anxiety and PTSD. PTSD. I lost Lockie and part of myself that day, two things I will never get back. Lachlan McLaren's parents revealed the devastation of losing their son. Mother Michelle sat with his body for hours, willing him to open his eyes. I had to walk away and leave my baby in a box and it shattered my heart into a million pieces. The popular high achiever was killed as he walked Ella home. Instead of celebrating his birthday, his parents rushed to the crime scene. Carrie McLaren Claren told the court the cruelty of his son's death had upended his life. Rage is blinding, consumed by anger. I don't know who I am anymore. Christopher Hennessy was not in the courtroom for the heart-wrenching victim impact statements. He appeared via video link, his head tilted down, not looking at the monitor showing the court. 32-year-old Hennessy will be sentenced on Monday. Cameron Bow, 7 News. Overseas, Ukrainian forces have reclaimed towns and villages that were taken by Moscow on the first day of their invasion. Russian fighters have fled from more than 6,000 square kilometres, including the entire Kharkiv region. It's clear the Ukrainians have made significant progress. I think this can be a long haul. 
U.S. officials are expected to announce more aid for Ukraine in coming days. The lights have gone out on the Eiffel Tower. Paris city officials are switching off its golden glow and twinkling lights earlier than usual, 1am, because of an energy crisis gripping the capital. It's been described as a purely symbolic gesture to increase awareness of the situation. And the prosecutor who ran the investigation that led to Bill Clinton's impeachment trial has died. Ken Starr produced a report into the US president's affair with Monica Lewinsky, which went on to become a best-selling book. Lewinsky said the news of Starr's death brought up complicated feelings. A quarter of a billion dollars will be spent ensuring Victorian students remain top of their class. The COVID catch-up tutor program has been extended for another year, helping thousands of schools across the state. $250 million, but it comes with rave reviews. It's helped me academically and pretty much it's not just helping me, it's helping all students across the program. The tutor program uses retired and casual relief teachers to support students struggling to catch up after COVID locked them out of class. Rolled out in 2021, it's now been extended to 2023. Uh, we want to make sure all kids have the best opportunity, no matter what school they go to, no matter what their background is, no matter what their parents are earning. It's a very one-on-one -on -one program, so it's very... Things come across a lot easier and you can understand more. 2,000 schools have signed on for the program, which employs over 5,000 tutors. Almost 100,000 students have taken part this year, 300 at Strathmore Secondary College. We've had students in class with teachers supporting them as tutors, and we've also withdrawn students for short periods of time to work individually with in a small group with a tutor. And as for if it's money well spent... We should be all celebrating this opportunity. It's absolutely necessary because if we don't, there's a, there's a risk and there's a cost associated with not doing that. Chanel Vella, 7 News. There are major concerns about the people cleared to work with our children. Next on 7 News, the warning from a key Victorian watchdog. Also a big payout for a politician named and shamed in an upskirting scandal. The remarkable new technology helping vision impaired to watch the footy. And later in sports, see what the stars are wearing to the brown light. Serious flaws have been exposed in Victoria's system to protect children from sex predators. A former Melbourne youth worker obtained a working with children check despite being investigated for an alleged rape. He was later jailed. The Ombudsman is pushing for an urgent overhaul. Channel 9 News has been forced to apologise to a former federal MP it falsely accused of taking a lewd photo. Dr Andrew Lamming settled with the broadcaster for an undisclosed sum, thought to be more than a million dollars. Andrew Lamming today leaving the federal court, having cleared his name. The former MP accused by Channel 9 News of taking a lewd photo of a female cafe worker last year. Today, a major backflip from Nine, admitting large parts of their story were false. The broadcaster has finally acknowledged that uh, the allegations from last year were not true. The allegations ended his political career. He was dumped by the Liberal National Party from his safe seat. The story caused a political scandal in an election year and it won Channel 9 a Walkley Award for Excellence in Journalism. The reporter was even named Queensland Journalist of the Year, even though Dr Lamming was suing over the story, saying it was false. After a courtroom humiliation, Nine said it has now seen material which indicates that the photograph Dr Lamming took was not loose in nature. Nine News withdraws those allegations and apologises to him and his family for the hurt and harm caused. These were not work-based allegations, they were deeply personal and hurtful. Other high-profile journalists at the ABC and Channel 10 have also been forced to apologise for their reporting of the alleged incident. The national broadcaster settling out of court at the expense of the taxpayer. While the total amount paid by Nine to Dr Lamming remains confidential, a senior legal source has told Seven News that the likely figure could be close to a million dollars, one of the largest defamation payouts to an Australian politician. Liam Tapper, 
7 News. It has been a dramatic day on the share market. Network Finance Editor Gemma Acton has the latest. Thanks, Peter. The biggest one-day tumble in three months for the ASX 200, down 181 points to 6,829. There was red ink right across the board with only a handful of stocks finishing higher. The Aussie dollar continues to fall. It's now buying 67.1 US cents, while Bitcoin has lost 10% in just the past day. Gold is just clinging on to 1,700 US dollars. That's after also getting caught up in the sell-off. And we hear a lot about inflation, but how much more are households actually spending compared to last year? One survey says it's about $20 more each month on petrol and about $35 more each month on both healthcare and insurance. Peter. Gemma Acton reporting. Magnets and microchips are being used by the AFL and Telstra to create a new match day experience for fans. Technology called Touch and Track helps vision impaired supporters follow every move with their fingers. This tablet connects football to fans who have trouble seeing the action, creating a real-time tracker as the ball bounces around the field. It's quite remarkable. It's something that I never thought would ever be around. Telstra, using 5G technology, claims this will further open AFL to almost half a million Australians who are vision impaired. Helps them to be able to experience AFL, one of the greatest sports in the, uh, in the world. The tablet uses magnets to move the ring representing the football. A data stream of XY coordinates of where the ball is on the field. And so um, as we do that, that data stream moves this uh, magnet underneath here and therefore moves the ring. Carlton's Corey Durden is a big supporter. Sister Cheyenne, who's 13, is visually impaired. It makes it so much better overall because not having that understanding completely at first, I can have it straight away now. Right in front centre is Durden, he's away. She's able to sort of experience live when I kick a goal. Uh, just makes that experience for her a lot better. Telstra says it's refining this prototype for further trials at next week's grand final. Blake Johnson, 7 News. Sport is next with Tim Watson and Tim James. Heard wasn't the only contender interviewed today. That's right, Mitch. The Bombers have held coaching talks today, but our cameras were there for the meetings. We'll have exclusive details next. Also, Mason Cox prepares to be the villain as the Magpies get set to head into enemy territory. The midfielder who's packed his bags and wants to head to Carlton. And why the Aussies are on the defence ahead of the World Cup. Welcome back. James Hurd heads the list of coaching contenders interviewed by the Bombers today. Returning to Chief Football Reporter Tom Brown. Tom, you've got details on who else they spoke to. Tim, it was a landmark day for the Bombers who conducted a full day of interviews here in the city at Ernst & Young, which is the firm responsible for conducting the club's football-wide review. Now, you can see there Jordan Lewis, who's on the coaching panel alongside Robert Walls, leaving the meetings and interviews just a short time ago. Seven News capturing those shots. Seven News was also there when Adam Uze interviewed this afternoon. Uze, a major candidate, as well as Brendan Laid, who was the surprise candidate Mitch Cleary discussed last night, arriving at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. Obviously, the big one, though, the big story today is James Hurd. Now, James, alongside the other coaches, has signed a non-disclosure agreement. I've spoken to James, so he can't obviously speak in regards to the process. He's definitely put his hand up. He definitely interviewed this morning, and I understand was very pleased with how the interview went this morning. Just for some context in terms of what could become a landmark story, this was James addressing his coaching intentions at the Giants earlier this year and the AFL's position, Gil McLaughlin's, earlier this year on the thought of her returning to senior coaching. Working with people, working with, you know, highly motivated men who want to be successful. I think there's, you know, I've got my story, I've got knowledge in that area. James Hurt, would the AFL support him coaching at a senior level again? Of course. So Adam Uze, Brendan Laid and James Hurd all interviewing here at Ernst & Young in the city today as part of Essendon's process to appoint a new coach. Clearly Hurd's interview will create a lot of discussion given his incredible history. He's a legend of the club but had a highly controversial exit but he's determined him to return to senior coaching next season and uh, take over at Essendon, Tim. Thanks, Tom. Mason Cox has revealed how a dinner date with Pies coach Craig McRae revived his career. The Ruckman heads to Sydney this weekend, relishing the role of playing the villain in front of the Swans fans at the SCG. From 90,000 fans in black and white to 45,000 in red and white. 
I kind of like it. It's a different atmosphere, something unique, and um, sometimes you go with Rubble and being the bad guy. Mason Cox returns to the scene of Collingwood's round 22 loss, hoping to bring that villain-like mentality. He's strutting around like he's best on ground as well, trying to create some energy for the Collingwood team. To spark another big upset and extend his perfect preliminary final record. And Cox again. Oh, it's getting better. Oh, it done one really well and everyone's already like kind of throwing it back to 2018. But um, yeah, I enjoy finals, man. Like this is what we play for. Overlooked early in the season, Cox has played the last 15 games straight. Here go, and the crowd will roar. A round six catch up with his coach, saving his career. Craig and I had a dinner together, sat down, talked about uh, a few different things. That upfront, honest conversation with the relationship we had is probably uh, what's kind of credited to me to be able to, I guess, play out throughout the rest of this year. It has an X factor about him, doesn't it? We've got a few on our team that ignite the crowd, and then the crowd ignites all of us. <laughs> and so he's, he's one of those guys. Mitch Duncan to play his seventh prelim against Brisbane. And unlike others, the Cats now less reliant on their stars. The whole feel of that even contribution, um, you know, probably feels different. Hoping just one game in 27 days will benefit with 10 players over 30. Probably with, with our age demographic a little bit, um, it might help a little bit more. And the exit meetings are coming thick and fast for players all across the country. Fremantle forward Rory Lobb has today requested a trade to the Western Bulldogs. His teammate, wingman Blake Akers, on his way out of the Dockers, packing his bags and will take up a three-year deal to move to Carlton under Michael Voss. St Kilda's Ben Long has also officially asked to be traded to Gold Coast. Tim? Thanks, Mitch. Still on AFL, and while Fremantle are the front runners for Demons Rackman, Luke Jackson, West Coast have made it clear they have genuine interest in making a play for the young star. There's a, an air of confidence that we think we can convince him. We think we're well placed with a range of possibilities. If we get the opportunity to trade for Luke, um, we can split selections to generate more. We've got future selections. The Eagles have picked two in the national draft. Josh Hazelwood says the ongoing speculation over Aaron Finch's future as T20 captain won't disrupt their World Cup title defence. The Aussies unveiled a new Indigenous designed uniform they'll wear for the tournament in six weeks. Hazelwood says the side can move on quickly if Finch is forced to fall on his sword. There's quite a lot of experience out there in the middle and I think you know, it'd be quite easy for the next captain to come in and, and just seamlessly transition that. Mitch Stark, Mitch Marsh and Marcus Stoinis will miss Australia's upcoming T20 tour of India with injuries. The squad flies out tomorrow. With the World Cup looming, Socceroos coach Graham Arnold will blood teenage prodigy Garen Quoll in next week's friendlies against New Zealand. Some of Europe's biggest clubs, including Barcelona and Chelsea, are looking at the 17-year-old. Tom Rogic won't play due to personal reasons, but Arnold says he'll be welcomed back with open arms. I've known Tommy for a long, long time. I've never held a grudge against anyone ever, and, I, and there is no reason to have a grudge. In the Champions League, Liverpool scored late to defeat Dutch champions Ajax 2-1 at Anfield. And Mitch, that's sport. James Hurd returning to Essendon as coach. That would be extraordinary. It would be extraordinary. Uh, I think there's a long way to go. That whole process has to play out. But at the end of that, if he is the best candidate, then good on him. Yeah, exactly. Good luck to him. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. After a two-year COVID hiatus, fashion will once again take centre stage on Brownlow night. Players' partners have one day less to get red carpet ready after the event was brought forward to avoid a clash with the Queen's funeral. It's the return of Melbourne's biggest and best red carpet. This year, there's no holding back. It's red carpet. It's our first brown low back after a couple of years, so comfort doesn't come into it. Fashion has become a brown low night centrepiece, expectations as big as the dresses. Max Gorn's wife, Jessica, is among the partners preparing. She'll be dressed by Megan Condipadero. She made my wedding dress, so it's nice to uh, get to wear one of her creations again. The designer is also dressing former North Melbourne coach Danny Laidley. It's amazing and it's a pleasure to dress such a diverse group of women as well. Celebrity stylist Lana 
Wilkinson predicts this year will be all about colour. So it's in Barbie Corp having doing the rounds. I think there's going to be lots of pink, lots of blue. Um, I think people are going to really kind of channel old Hollywood as well as really kind of that 90s Versace. And guests will be ready to take a fashion risk. People are going to be really experimenting with their fashion. Um, speaking as a Melbourneian, I was rocking around in athleisure wear for way too long. Despite the last minute date change, Crown says it hasn't impacted preparations for the prestigious event that's being held here for the first time since 2019. 500 staff will work across the event, each covering around 26,000 steps, setting out 7,600 glasses and almost 5,000 plates, equivalent to the length of seven football fields. It will be uh, all ready to roll on Sunday afternoon. And you can watch it all here on 7. Sarah Jones, 7 News. Jane Bunn is next with the forecast. And Jane, the sunshine was nice while we had it. <laughs> Rich, it certainly was, but there is rain on the way tonight. And I'll show you the many bursts of wet weather that are coming in the days ahead. All of that is next. Tonight on our special edition of The Latest from 7 News at 8.40, our royal team is in key positions for the procession starting soon. The Queen's coffin taken through London, the King and senior royals in step behind it. Crowds building, facing a two-day wait to see Her Majesty lie in state. Every moment live from 8.40. As events unfold in the UK overnight, you'll know first on Sunrise. For Australia's most comprehensive coverage, start with Sunrise. Hello again. It remained dry all day as promised and rain should begin in the next few hours. This morning there were clear skies and hardly a breath of wind. The city began the day on 3.5. It quickly thawed out in the sunshine, rising to a top of 18. A northerly wind picked up this afternoon, but it was certainly pleasant if you were sheltered from that wind. In the late afternoon, sheets of high cloud appeared over Melbourne. That is a sign of a change on the way. This is what the sky looked like in Mildura. These are known as Mamata's clouds. They indicate the potential for hail. The sunshine was ahead of a band of cloud advancing from the west. A few hours after that cloud arrives, light and patchy rain begins. Now, large areas of thunderstorms did cross South Australia and they moved into northwestern Victoria later this afternoon. The warmth and sunshine were thanks to a high that is moving out to our east. However, the next weather system is large and complicated. All of this in through here is driven by a low that is slow moving over the bight. And until that moves out to our east, we'll be hit by wave after wave of wet weather. We are in that first wave now. Generally light and patchy rain, that's overnight into tomorrow morning. It is heavier though along the northern slopes of the ranges. That there is that first wave and it eases during the day tomorrow. We've actually got warm sunshine to follow. We are not done. The next burst arrives on Friday. This is gusty showers, this time with cold air and some alpine snow. You guessed it, there's more over the weekend too. Another burst on Saturday, further gusty showers and alpine snow, then yet another burst on Sunday and this lingers into Monday. Then that low finally moves away and calming high pressure comes in instead. Around the nation tomorrow, this brings 10 to 20 millimetres of rain to Sydney, but it's dry all day in Brisbane before patchy rain there at night. Dry at first in Adelaide, then showers redevelop. It is showery in Perth. To Victoria, areas of rain. These are over central and eastern parts in the morning. It mostly clears up during the afternoon. Only the odd patch remains. The west is generally dry. Only the risk of showers in the southwestern corner later. Closer in, rain overnight. It clears out during the morning. There's only the slightest risk of a shower left over. The map here shows we are generally dry tomorrow in the Melbourne area. So that rain should be well and truly done by 9am. And the day is actually quite nice. Lots of sunshine returns. It rises back up to 18. On the eight-day outlook, get ready for waves of wet weather to come through, lasting for a few days. There's a pattern, generally dry in the morning, then lots of showers in the afternoon and 
evening, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and so we've got some on Monday as well. So that means there could be some showers moving through at the footy. The rain clears in the morning and sunshine returns tomorrow, then it rises back up to 18, so tomorrow afternoon, quite nice, Mitch. You get some beautiful weather photos from the viewers, don't you? Oh, I do indeed, and those Mamatis clouds in Mildura this afternoon, they were quite spectacular. Keep them coming. Thanks very much, Jane. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 14th of September. Thanks for your company. For now, from the 7 News team, good night.